Between the years 1854 and 1929, life as an orphan in New York City changed drastically. Immigrants were coming from all over the world, particularly Europe, and the city's population was increasing significantly. But this increase caused many problems, one of which was the amount of orphans. Many of the orphans' parents were immigrants who had come to the U.S., and disease and unemployment made it hard for many people to take care of their children, so they were forced to give them up. Children were living on the streets or in orphanages and often saw no hope. That is, until the orphan train. Charles Loring Brace of the Child's Aid Society decided to take action. He and over 30 other organizations came up with a solution, the orphan train. The country was developing quickly in the sense of people moving to the west, so the organizations placed the orphans on trains and spread them out westward. Once the train reached cities in the Midwest and the West, usually couples who didn't have or wanted more children would adopt the orphans from the trains. The overall goal was to give children who would otherwise live on the streets of New York City a chance to thrive and have a good, successful life. On their journey to their new home and in their new home, the children encountered many things. Unfortunately, not every child was given to a loving and caring family. Some were just adopted to work on the family's farms. But many of the orphans were embraced and loved by the new family. Shaley George of the National Orphan Train Complex tells us of these encounters. Wow, and so their whole life changed. Their whole idea of, of who they were and how life worked changed because they were moved out of the city and put into a farm community. They got to see you know, how people really Since all different kinds of children boarded the orphan train, many ideas, traditions, and thoughts were exchanged. Shaley George explains that. The parents didn't have to pay for the kids, and they didn't pay the parents to take the children either. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess for exchange, I think the ideas and the cultures that met up. Mm -hmm. We looked through the annual reports recently, and for Children's Aid Society, and there were 41 different nationalities accounted for with these children. So that's 41 different countries, that spans five continents. And so when you have five Egyptians coming in 1870, the ideas that those kids would have, even if they're only seven, are going to stick with them and they're going to influence those families. The train moved everywhere in America, but generally in the West. Shaley George tells us about that. You know, at the time that the orphan train started and, and kept going through, we were exploring the West at that point as a nation. Mm -hmm. And Charles knew that you know, if you push these kids out into the farm country, a farmer was going to have an open table. They were going to have more food for those kids. And so without that exploration, of the country and without the train system, it wouldn't have happened. And so the trains, I mean, they were exploring new territory, they were delving into something they had never seen before and moving us so much farther west. And without the train being what it was, it would never have happened. Judy Jacobus is the daughter of train rider John Jacobus. John Jacobus was born in June of 1912. He was given to the Child's Aid Society as a baby, as an abandoned child. Jacobus stayed in the society until he boarded the orphan train in 1915. As a young baby, he was pre-selected off the train by a family. Jacobus was moved to Ottawa, Kansas and lived there until later moving to Phoenix, Arizona in 1937. Since Jacobus was pre-selected, he didn't have to go through the process of being picked off the train. He was sent to his new home immediately. So for exploration, he was just sent to the Midwest and traveled on the train. Jacobus was only two and a half when sent on his journey, so he doesn't recall most of it. Judy said, he made the comment once or twice, I behaved the way I did because I did not want to be sent away again. Judy said, Dad's mother treated him very much like a son and was very good to him. His father? not as much as his mother. 
His adoptive father favored his biological son, my uncle, over my dad, and my dad was, at times, hard to deal with. Because of this, John spent a year on a farm in western Kansas and learned how to do many things, such as milk cows and ride horses. Jacobus served as an army medic in the Philippines during World War II and then was released in 1946 and moved to Long Beach, California. John Jacobus experienced exchange in history because if he had never been put on the orphan train or if he had just stayed in an orphanage for all his life, he most likely wouldn't have the opportunities that he did have. He most likely would have received a poor education which would have made it harder to get jobs and make a living. So Jacobus exchanged a new way of life which might have been scary at first for a life full of love. Jacobus encountered a new way of life when moving out west. As mentioned before, he learned farm ways of life and established a better life than the one he would have had living on the streets or in an orphanage. He also encountered a new family. His story of encounter is much like most of the other orphan train riders. Although Jacobus rarely talked about his experiences on the train, Judy says, although he never said it, I believe Dad appreciated the orphan train because it gave him a life he would not have had otherwise. Jacobus later became a letter carrier for the Postal Service and was an outstanding woodworker. But the thing Jacobus enjoyed the most was spending time with his family and being an active member of his church and community. Jacobus and his family traveled around the world, visiting places such as Europe and Asia. Although being an orphan train writer affected his life greatly, it didn't define John Jacobus. The exploration, encounter, and exchanges he faced made him the amazing man he was.